Okay, so as you said, I'm Pamela, and I'm going to interrupt your regularly scheduled back-to-back -back talks about web performance to talk about something that I think many of you are probably secretly interested in, even if you don't realize it, and that's getting more people programming, and specifically getting the next generation programming. They'll be the people at VelocityConf 20 years from now, uh, figure out how to make our websites load fast from our colony on the moon or maybe on the comets now that we land on comets. And we need to get more than programming. Why do we need more people programming? Well, the big obvious reason is that there's projected to be way more computing jobs than CS graduates in the future. And big software companies are freaking out because they don't know who they're going to employ five years from now to write all this software. But besides that, it's the belief of many, including myself, that computing should be a part of general literacy. Even if you don't actually become a software engineer, it helps people to understand this stuff. So it helps to talk with your tech colleagues if you understand what they're talking about. And it will help people to understand those tricky political issues we have today, like net neutrality and NSA privacy invasion, and, you know, whatever you're going on here, if you actually understand how computers work. So even if a student doesn't major in CS, it's still going to be way better for them and the world at large if they get how computers work. So the numbers in those graphs weren't good, and in performance land, we're all about numbers, right? Yay, graphs, numbers, woo! So how can we get those numbers better? How we, can we increase those numbers and get more students learning programming when they're young? So let's see how I got into programming to see if that gives us any insights, and just because I want to show you how cool I was when I was a kid. Uh, so I was raised by two computer science parents. I had five computers and a T1 line. <laughs> Uh, in case it's not obvious, I was incredibly fortunate. I was privileged up the wazoo, and I used the shit out of that privilege. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, what? probably actually a lot of us were a little bit lucky, and that's why we're, you know, we can be here today as programmers. But we can't rely on luck anymore because we need to get way more programmers. So we have to lower the barriers for learning to program so that we can let unlucky people get in the door who don't get raised by computer science parents and all that. And there's actually a lot of ways that we can lower the barriers, and there's a bunch of ways that you all can help. So I'm going to talk about a bunch of the barriers for learning a program and suggest different things that you could do if you want to help. OK, first, many students don't have a computer at home. Uh, or if they do, maybe it's something that's hard to program on, like an iPad. I don't know if you've tried, but I've, I've actually watched students try to program for six hours on an iPad, and that is impressive. But it's hard. And there's also many classrooms that don't have computers or enough computers. So what you could do is you could actually donate your, your old computers to your friends, kids, or local classrooms. Um, and in the US, we have a program called DonorsChoose.org where you can fund classrooms that are raising money for laptops. So maybe there's programs like that here, or you could start a program like that so that more people actually have access to computers. Because you can try to teach computing without computers, but there's only so far you can go, and eventually it really helps to have a computer. Um, actually, when I was a kid in home ec class, I made a stuffed computer <laughs> instead of all the stuffed animals we were supposed to make. All right, so once you have a computer, the first thing that we normally do when we're programming, we set up our local environment, you know, making sure Node.js is up to date, and our Python, and installing an IDE. And you might consider that a necessary ritual improving your self-worth as a programmer, but I just consider that an unnecessary barrier. People that are new to programming shouldn't have to figure out how to set up a local environment to get programming. They should just be able to get started. It just gets too frustrating too fast. The number of times that I've gone to the bathroom and just cried for an hour because I can't get the freaking Python dependencies to work, it's just ridiculous. Uh, so what we can do is have more online programming environments that don't have that setup. And yeah, you're going to have to learn how to set up one day, but that doesn't have to be the first step to learning. Now, there's a bunch of online programming environments. I'm really proud of our interactive real-time one on Khan Academy for JavaScript and HTML and, uh, and SQL. But there's a ton more, too. There's JSPin, uh, Code Sculptor, Scratch, Replit. And all of these offer debug tools to help students find problems in their code. And a lot of them have ways that they can share and save with the community. But I think we're just scratching the surface, because there's still a lot more that you can't learn online. Like, what if you wanted to learn hardware, but you didn't actually have the money 
to buy hardware yet, or you didn't have the money to buy it for your whole classroom. So I think it would be really cool if there was an online emulator for Arduino or Pies or robotics. Or what if you wanted to learn how to program Objective-C to make an iPhone app? I've seen one website that tries to do this, and so they actually compile Objective-C over the web and stream an interactive iPhone app, and that is just this really, really slow, because that is a performance class all of its own. So that's not solved yet. Or what if you wanted to actually make a 3D game? Now maybe some of you have seen Brendan Eich play Doom in the browser, because he just really likes playing those shooting games. Um, and that's really cool, but wouldn't it be cool if you could actually program Doom in the browser? Now that would be really impressive. But we're still a little ways off from there. So whatever it is that you're passionate about, types of programming, consider starting an open source project or contributing an open source project to make it possible to learn that in the browser. And maybe you could do something to help people learn systems operations, right? I think that would be really cool, like virtual servers that suddenly start having a problem and you have to rescue them. Oh, it'd be cool. So you should do it. Um, so let's say that you know, there's some students that once they have access to a computer and on online environment, they'll start programming. But many students are busy and they don't have the time for it. And they're more likely to learn to program if there's actually time set out in their schedule for it. Uh, but most schools don't have CS classes in the US. Uh, nine out of 10 high schools do not have a CS class. And code.org is trying to change that in the US with local laws and petitions, which you could try to do here. And uh, actually, oh, these are the old sites. Okay, well, in Madrid, uh, in Madrid, they actually recently passed a law that says all the secondary school students can uh, now have to learn programming. So there's going to be a bunch of teachers in Madrid trying to figure out how to teach programming. So maybe you could actually help introduce teachers to programming or even guest teach yourself. Uh, but it takes a while to introduce CS classes into a school. So maybe you could start with an introduction and, uh, or start with after school coding clubs. So these coding clubs here, this is something that you could start yourself um, or at a library, at a school. And, uh, and I help out at the local Coder Dojo and it's really, really fun because you get to be in this space with a bunch of middle schoolers getting really pumped up out of programming and then you're like, oh right, that's why programming is so fun because it's actually really fun, I forgot. Um, and uh, so you could start one if you can't find one and it doesn't matter if you don't like teaching because there's online courses like you know, Khan Academy, Code Academy and you just have to provide the space and the support and the food, they really like free pizza. Just FYI. Um, and then they program pizzas. Every time I do one of these, they just program pizzas, whatever. So it's cool. Um, so once you get students actually learning programming, they still, we still want a bunch of them to go on to actually have a computer science career, because as I say, we need some software engineering graduates. But according to research, a lot of young people don't actually understand what it is that we do <laughs> with our, our uh, degree. And actually, when I was a computer science major, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it either, so I don't blame them. Um, so, and especially for females, they don't realize that you can use computer science to make the world a better place, and that's actually really important, and that is a lot of what we do. So what we can do is actually tell people what it is we do. Right, share, share those stories and let them know the vast diversity of things that you can do with a computer science career. Uh, so on Khan Academy, we have a series where you can meet professionals. They're like physics programmers, mobile app developers, indie game makers, product managers, all of that. Um, there's also Computing is Everywhere and Made with Code that shows how computer science intersects with dancing and Pixar and basketball and all that cool stuff. So, if you know a kid, share this with them, or if you know a teacher, ask them to, to highlight this to their students maybe once a week. And then they'll realize all the different things that you can do with computer science. Uh, so I only had nine minutes for this talk, so those is not an exhaustive list of barriers. There are a lot of barriers to learning code, but hopefully that gives you some ideas of the different barriers and ways that you can help with them. And I'll leave you with one goal, which is to find a way to lower the barriers for one kid to learn to code, and then tell me how you did it, and tell others how you did it. Thank you. <laughs>